Hello and welcome to the Spike Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and I'm delighted to be joined down the line this week by two brilliant Spiked columnists. We've got Ella Whelan, hello. Hi. And uh, Rakib Essan. Hello. Coming up on today's show, we'll be discussing Islamist terror, the Welsh gender reforms and Sadiq Khan's war on the car. So there's been several stories this week that have really highlighted Britain's seeming inability to get to grips with Islamism. First we, firstly, we had the William Shawcross review into the Prevent programme, highlighting some of its pretty egregious failures. Secondly, uh, we've had the welcome return of Salman Rushdie. He appeared for his first interview and first photographs uh, since he was horrifically stabbed last year. And finally, uh, the less than welcome return, I think we can say, of uh, Shamima Begum, who's been plastered all across the UK media, appearing in the BBC and in the Times. Let's talk about uh, the prevent issue first. Rakib, um, do you want to outline some of the failings highlighted by this um, Shawcross review? So the Shawcross review, uh, its central point is that the government's prevent programme, which has the primary purpose of safeguarding people from uh, either becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism, uh, Shawcross has concluded that it is out of kilter with the rest of the UK's counter-terrorism system and the wider terror threat picture in the UK. So what I mean by that is the ideological composition of cases referred to prevent now that there are public bodies in education healthcare also the police uh, referrals can also be made by family friends uh, other community members the cases being referred to prevent uh, don't really stack up with mm. the ideological makeup of the country's terror threat um, which the primary terror threat being islamist extremism so when you're looking at the number of live investigations um, associated with the counterterrorism policing network, 80% of those investigations are Islamist related. Yeah. When you look at the number of cases referred to prevent, the latest uh, annual figures show that only 16% of those cases um, are Islamist related. It's essentially, it's that right wing, you know, or fears of right wing terrorism are being um, referred to prevent. And that seems to be the main uh, issue being tackled, including people like incels and stuff like that, even though there haven't been any uh, incel terror attacks in Britain. Whereas, you know, think of the amount of horrific attacks, um, horrific Islamist attacks there have been in the past few years, you know, killing um, scores and scores of people. Ella, one of the other aspects that seems to be highlighted um, is that this PREVENT program essentially treats terrorists as almost like victims. It talks about radicalization as almost a passive process uh, rather than, you know, rather than something criminal, essentially. Yes, and we know that, I mean, tragically, one of the um, terrorist incidents that have taken place in the last few years occurred uh, um, during a, a conference that was based on the kind of rehabilitation of individuals. There has been a sort of the way in which um, discussions about why Islamists uh, activists do the things that they do and commit the terror um, offences that they do in sort of media discussion and columnists that nine times out of ten there is some kind of part of that discussion that that looks at well you know these people were persecuted or they did face Islamophobia and you know there's always some kind of way in which the excuse for you know killing your fellow citizens is found in the idea that this person is is a victim themselves was victimized and is and to most sensible people that reads as letting them off the hook i mean yeah. it reads as um saying that there is a reason why this person was justified in in doing what they did and i was you know i've got nothing better to do these days than watch bbc parliament and was lucky enough to catch um the interaction between suella braverman and Yvette cooper um, talking about this, uh, the, the Shawcross report. And it was just quite remarkable how, you know, whatever you think of Suella Braverman, um, almost immediately after she had made her sort of speech on the basis of promising to implement some of the suggestions made in the report, there were these demands from the other side of the house to say, will you promise that you will take seriously um, 
any kind of issues with Islamophobia and you will not let far right extremism run away. And it's like, you can't, I mean, you can't win. You've mm. just had a report that says that, you know, there's too much focus on on this side of things. Um, and then you have politicians essentially just repeating the same old lines as, as a kind of in a performative way to sort of at this point um, look like they're doing the right thing rather than actually deal with the genuine security threats we might have in this country. Ricky, what, what do you think is the driver of this? Is it identity politics, political, political correctness? Why are people running away from the real threats and gravitating towards um, right-wing terrorism can be a threat, of course, but why, why, why is there that focus? I don't think we're trivialising the threat of uh, far-right extremism at all. In fact, it is the fastest growing threat in the country. The, the problem is that many people mistake fastest growing with prevailing terror threat. They're two mm. very different measurements. I, I think that when you're looking at the prevent referrals, there is a possibility in left-leaning uh, public institutions uh, Professionals within those institutions are more comfortable with making referrals when it comes to um, cases associated with extreme right wing radicalization. But there may be a cultural reluctance to do the same when it comes to Islamist related uh, cases of radicalization. It could be for fear of being accused of being racist, Islamophobic or being uh, blamed for undermining religious freedom. Uh, and that really needs to change because when it comes to matters of security, there's simply no place for political correctness and radical identity politics. Unfortunately, we've seen those problematic dynamics when it comes to Britain's long-standing grooming, game, uh, grooming gangs crisis, yeah. where I do feel that there have been police forces. They've ultimately caved into various forms of racial and religious sensitivity, and the most vulnerable in society have paid the price for that. We we touched on the idea that of um, sort of Islamists being treated as victims, um, as as kind of passive recipients of ideology, or you know, people we shouldn't look to offend. Um, Ella, that I think that brings us neatly on to Shamima Begum, um, who has been all over the media this week. Um, people might have seen the sort of primetime BBC Two documentary um, where she's given the chance to tell her story in her own words. She's been on the front page of the Times magazine last Saturday, looking like the basically the poster girl. <laughs> Ella, what have you made, what have you made of that? It seems like there's almost an attempt to rehabilitate her. Well, I think there's certainly been an attempt to, um, you know, at least treat her like some kind of celebrity. There's, you know, it's not really done that you put people who are linked in allegedly linked in some way, whether it's you know through marriage or through actions to such extreme violence as what took place um, in the Islamic State that get sort of not only um, front page splashes, but a sort of um, tell all kind of confessional that you might find, you know, sort of in the inside pages of OK Magazine. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite bizarre. But there's, you know, the the, in, the sort of, the, the sort of sickeningly interesting thing about Shamima Begum is that on the one hand, you have, so many people arguing that she was just a child, that she d doesn't, you know, isn't really of any interest, shouldn't really be an obsession for people. You know, uh, we, we get accused of saying that, you know, why are you still talking about her? And yet these same people are now making her front page news. And, you know, there is, it, 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 can, it can only be one of two things. Either she was a young idiot who didn't know what she was doing, regrets it completely. And, you know, is uh, one of history's sort of mistakes. Or she is, I think if you go by what she herself has said, as we've been forced to read and listen to several interviews for her, but at this point, you know, admits to the fact that she knew about beheadings, admits to the fact that she was, you know, that she was involved in certain things that happened um, in her time in the camps and knows that she saw some things, you know, and so, <laughs> you know, I don't know how much sort of airbrushing and sort of the wearing of like cool um, kind of trendy clothes is going to cover up what I think most people know is that if you link yourself to an, you know, an ideology like Islamism, um, then you're not going to be rehabilitated or forgiven by splashing yourself across the front pages. I think it's definitely true that the um, the more recent interviews are a lot more kind of practiced and yeah, that she does, you know, unwittingly reveal some things, but um, <laughs> they're they're a lot more guarded. I mean, you, people will recall some of the interviews from a few years ago, back in 2019, when she was um, when she was discovered essentially by by the Times. Um, 
she was talking about how she supported the um, Manchester Arena bombing in 2017. She talked about seeing severed um, heads in bins, and that was fine because those heads probably belong to the enemies of Islam. Um, now she's saying she's been groomed, she's been trafficked, she's a victim of um, all kinds of things, including marital abuse, it seemed like, from that BBC documentary. Um, Rakeem, what do you make of that? I mean, she's not a victim, is she? Oh, I've always been very uncomfortable with the victim framing of Shamima Begum. Um, many people use her age as a defence. Uh, I'd make the point that she's 15 years of age um, when she decided to leave the UK and join ISIS in Syria. That's five years above the age of criminal responsibility in England and Wales. Um, so I, I also feel that there's this uh, tendency among uh, many liberal-minded commentators to strip her of all individual agency and personal responsibility. And I think comparing it with the victims of the grooming gangs crisis mm. uh, in the UK, I've never truly understood that comparison. Um, uh, so I feel that more generally, uh, the victim framing of Shamima Begum is actually quite insulting as well towards many many British Muslim schoolgirls who would reject any form of extremist advance at the earliest opportunity. Yeah. So all, all in all, uh, definitely not my cup of tea. And I actually find it quite unsavoury. Yeah, definitely. And finally, let's talk a bit about um, Salman Rushdie. Uh, he appeared in um, The New Yorker this week, his first big interview and his first um, first photographs of him since he uh, lost an eye in a, in a horrific attempt um, on his life. Um, Ella, this is a sort of stark and horrific reminder um, that it's not just, you know, life that can be lost from the Islamist threat. It's our way of life. It's our free speech. It's it's the values we hold dear that are also under threat. Yeah. And the, you know, the way in which Salman Rushdie engages in the world has been irrevocably changed by the actions of that individual. Um, you know, the he can't, he's a writer famous writer who now mm. can't, is you know struggling to use do the tools of his trades he has to read on a uh, ipad he can't read books anymore he has to you know he's, he's um blind in one eye but actually i think the really important point which we should you know we've talked about the sort of dark side of this but the the sort of if you like the hopeful side of the kind of discussion about um how to tackle terrorism how to tackle um islamist extremism it lives in an individual like Salman Rushdie and that mm. he, you know, it was quite a stirring image that was put out of him, a black and white sort of, with his, you know, um, sort of mutilated lips and stuff. But he actually put a picture out, a jolly picture out on Twitter of himself yeah. saying that it's a lovely photo and, well, you know, it's a, it's a striking photo, but I actually, you know, I actually don't look that bad. And I thought that was, that was really actually something for him to do that because what he was essentially saying is you haven't, you haven't killed my spirit. I'm yeah. still, um, you know, the, I, it, my body might be mutilated, but my, you know, my spirit of defiance, um, is not. And he was even having a joke about, imagine being able to have a joke about being attacked like that. Um, uh, on such a public scale, I think it's really inspiring. And, you know, we always say that the, you know, there are two levels to these kind of extremist attacks. There are, um, you know, what, what Islamists seek to do is on the one hand, literally kill people and literally damage lives. I mean, mm. in terms of violence, but also to try and curtail the way in which we live in countries like the, you know, the UK, where we live free lives, we go about our daily lives without fear, we go to pop concerts, we drink in pubs, you know, we we do all these things. Um, we, we write what we want to write, uh, you know, uh, without the government clamping down on us, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, we live in a supposedly free society. And I think Salman Rushdie is a really great example of that kind of defiant spirit that we need to keep alive because that is part of the fight against this um, nihilistic ideology. Rakeev, um, just final thought on this. Um, isn't it, although as, as inspiring as Salman Rushdie is and his defiance, uh, his defiance in the wake of this, and, and in fact throughout the kind of whole fatwa experience since the 1980s has been, isn't there a danger that, you know, many people, particularly on the kind of liberal left, people who a part of the literary world even, who you would expect to stand up for free speech, 
um, to stand up against Islamist intolerance just aren't willing to lend their voice to that. Well, there's a great deal of cowardice. Um, that that's the truth of it, and I think that that there is, um, in my view, those who may well feel intimidated, and I think I think that, that that they may well have understandable understandable concerns for their own safety. Uh, but I, re- I thought there was a there was a real lack of solidarity in the writing profession following that dreadful attack on Sir Salman Rushdie. I think the way he's dealt with it is hugely admirable. He's shown a great deal of resilience and determination. But I, I do think there needs to be a great deal of soul searching in the writing profession. Um, that th- there were many people stepping up to the plate and condemning uh, the attack. And I think that we have to be very robust in our defence of liberal democratic values, such as the freedom of expression, especially in our country, where you do see people trying to introduce a variety of rules and regulations, which in my view do amount to blasphemy laws. Mm. And I think that we have to push against that. You know, shaving is one of those things I used to always forget to do. My razor would get blunt, I'd forget to buy new blades, and then I'd just fall out of the routine entirely. But not anymore. Not now that I've found Harry's. It's made shaving and looking my best so incredibly easy. The razors work really well. They've got a weighted handle and a five blade cartridge that makes shaving feel incredibly smooth and simple. And they work even better when used with Harry's foaming shave gel. Plus a clean shave isn't the only thing Harry's is helping me out with right now. Recently, I've started using their brightening eye cream to hide the effects of all those late nights and early mornings. Having a proper skincare routine is now made so much easier for me with the Harry's subscription service. It means I never have to remember to buy new shaving gear or creams before they run out. And if I ever want to adjust or switch up my products, I can always make any changes directly from my account page. Take it from me. Once you start using Harry's, you'll never look back. The best way to get started is with a Harry's trial set, which Spikes podcast listeners can now get for free. And it includes Harry's fantastic brightening eye cream to keep you looking even sharper and fresher than ever. So make sure to support our podcast and start your own skincare journey by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is the £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com slash spiked and have your trial set and brightening eye cream delivered straight to your door. That's harrys.com slash spiked. So the Welsh government has uh, announced its plans to make it easier for people to change gender. Welsh First Minister Mark Drakeford is set to ask the UK government for permission to have the powers um, in order to uh, introduce these gender reforms. Ella, I mean, we've just had the debacle in Scotland um, over gender self-ID. It seems to have done significant damage to Nicola Sturgeon's credibility and that of the SNP. Um why on earth is Mark Drakeford following in her footsteps? <laughs> well, why on earth does Mark Drakeford do anything that he does? I mean, he's not exactly <laughs> a politician that has covered himself in glory and people will remember his legacy throughout the pandemic. But I think at this point, it's very hard to not be cynical in relation to these kind of announcements about gender reforms, where this literally looks like a competition as to what devolved government can be the shiniest, best, most kind of rainbow colored mm. um, institution. Any sensible politician would look at what would, you know, in a kind of cold sort of sanguine, sensible way, look at the mess that has taken place just in terms of the creation of legislation in Scotland, how it was not going to work in, you know, in relation to coming into contact with equality law and the rest of the UK, you know, the fact that it so many people were opposed to it, both in Scotland and outside of Scotland. And why would you then want to do something similar you know mm. why why would you want why would you want to piss off so many people basically on the basis of such a small minority of activists who push for this kind of um gender reform and you know we, i think it tells you something about the way in which how unserious actually so much of the pushing for greater gender reforms greater access to self id um downplaying of the you know the the importance and truth of sex difference is it's just this kind of game mm. where it's all it seems like now as who can piss off Westminster the most and you know the people who lose out 
to the greatest extent in this game is, you know, the whole of wider society that's watch, watching politicians lie to us, but also is, you know, is it, uh, you know, we everybody listening to this podcast knows how much I hate talking about women as, you know, minority groups and talking about women as vulnerable groups and all of that. But, you know, is, you know, p- women who are accessing s- single sex spaces like rape crisis centers are having to constantly defend those spaces against yeah. this kind of crap legislation. And, you know, you can understand why people are getting pretty sick and fed up of it now. Um, Rakeed, within, you know, a couple of days of the UK government blocking Nicola Sturgeon's bill, there was the news of uh, one rapist who claimed to be transgender um, being transferred to a woman's prison. Um, another one came out a few days after that. It was a, it was a, a man arrested for stalking, but also had a very violent history in prisons and he was due to be sent to a woman's prison. And now this week we've had the story about um, a transgender kidnapper who presumably, um, if none of this row had become so public, if it hadn't embarrassed the SNP, um, would probably be on his way to a woman's prison if he were found guilty. I mean, what does it say about our political class that they are either ignoring this or just don't see it as an issue? I just think that I just don't understand why radical transgender transgenderism would be a political hill to die on. Yeah, for some of these politicians, I find it remarkable. I thought Ella's appear a recent appearance on Question Time was excellent, um, and I think that what it also showed though is that when this issue, um, when it gets into more traditional working class communities, and you have many of those in Glasgow. Uh, many people are brought back to reality uh, mm. on on this issue. I think that when you're looking at the issue of gender self identification, I, I think we really have to be honest about the threat to the ent- integrity of sensitive female only spaces. Um, that that's including rape crisis centres, domestic violence sanctuaries, uh, also the threat that it poses to the integrity of women's sports. But Ella makes a very important point. This is just ultimately a matter of truth isn't it? And I think that p- people who are just looking to ignore the biological realities of sex, um, they're ultimately doing a grave disservice to the, the common sense of the majority of the British public. Uh, so so I, d- I do also think that more generally, when you're looking at this um, politically, uh, I think that there could be a tension now within the Labour Party yeah. here between the, the Welsh Labour Party and um, the British wide Labour Party, you could say, which is headed by Sir Keir Starmer. Um, so, so I think that it's a real tension which is emerging on the left. A tension, in my view, that I find it remarkable that it even exists. <laughs> you know, Ricky uh, brings up a really interesting point, which is that, you know, not only do we have um, governments, you know, devolved governments and national governments warring with each other in terms of how to implement or block this kind of legislation. But there's now going to be rifts within political parties. And we know that there's this kind of, there's there's this kind of sense of bad faith going on. And, you know, it was it was um, made quite obvious during question time with my interactions with the SNP um, uh, minister, Jenny Gilruth, who, you know, is uh, married to Kezia Dugdale um, from the Labour Party. Kezia Dugdale is an individual who, up until not so long ago, um, was very critical of these kind of gender reforms. Was you know quite sensible on it, and then you know the tide turns and they suddenly start parroting the stuff that you know that they don't believe is true. I mean, it just it can't be the case that, for example, um, S and P politicians who know the law in Scotland, which is that male, you know, that a rapist, a male rapist is, you know, charged on the basis that he has, you know, penetrated someone with a penis. Um, that, that that you cannot, you know, why would you not be able to use the word male and the pronouns he for that person if you didn't understand Scottish law? So there is this sense, I think, that most people have, which is, you know, whatever, whatever sort of you think about the extent to which you agree with gender critical side or you know what? Where where on the kind of, in the debate you are on this? It's very clear to everyone that politicians aren't telling the truth of what they actually think. They're just so terrified either way of of um, coming down either side on this. I think it's quite remarkable that there's been a change in terms of you know you don't hear politicians say anymore um, trans women are women, and yes, I believe that people who you know 
that have transitioned, have cervixes and all the rest of it. They're, they've kind of been a bit cowed from that, but they're still not telling the truth. And so I think we just have to keep pushing to say that, and you know, politicians shouldn't be lying to the public. Um, and, you know, if it does bring up some kind of rifts in political parties, then good. I think this is a debate that has to be had much more publicly and much more loudly. It was great to see on, on Question Time last week, Ella, your pushing of the uh, SNP minister producer to essentially argue that there are three genders, men, women and rapists. Uh, but there you go. <laughs> if you're anything like me, then you'll love a good Netflix binge every now and again. The thing is, though, if you're watching Netflix without using ExpressVPN, then you're missing out on a world of amazing content. Let me put it this way. It's a bit like buying tickets to see your favorite band, but only being allowed to see the support act. What most people don't realize is that what's on Netflix in the UK is completely different from what someone in, say, Australia or Singapore can watch over there. There's thousands of shows out there, but you'll only get access to a fraction of them if you stick to what's available in your own country. With ExpressVPN, you can unlock all that extra content. The way it works is that it lets me tell Netflix that I'm in a different country. And with over 90 countries to choose from, when I run out of things to watch, I can just switch to another country and unlock new shows. So let me give you an example. I've used ExpressVPN to watch some incredible movies like Parasite, The Godfather, and Dune. None of these are actually available on UK Netflix. To watch them, all I had to do was open the ExpressVPN app, change my location to the right country, and when you hit refresh, the film will be right there. And here's the best bit. It's not just for Netflix either. You can use ExpressVPN to unlock all other streaming services like Hulu or ESPN. Plus, ExpressVPN is incredibly fast. You can watch whatever you want without worrying about any buffering. It works on your phone, your laptop, and even your smart TV. So you can enjoy all that unlocked content on the big screen too. So be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash spiked. Don't forget to use our link at expressvpn.com slash spiked to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. So finally, let's move on to talk about Sadiq Khan's plans to expand the ULES, the ultra low emission zone. There's a bit of a revolt going on. Uh, four outer London councils say they're going to refuse to implement it. They're considering launching a legal challenge. Um, this is a scheme that's going to um, cost Londoners a great deal. Basically, if you have an old um, and not so eco-friendly car, you can pay a daily uh, congestion charge just to take it out for a drive. Ella, Sadiq says this is all about air pollution. Um, it's all about people stopping people dying from air pollution um, even. What do you make of those kind of claims? They're outlandish um, and they amount to a kind of emotional blackmail of people who are arguing that Londoners should be free to get about their capital city um, without, you know, easily and efficiently, mm. um, you know, and in their own vehicles. Um, there is the kind of a use and abuse of the very tragic case of a little girl called Ella who um, had on her, you know, on her death certificate was officially logged as that um, pollution was part of the reason why and air pollution was part of the reason why she had died. And that is used as a kind of poster um, campaign to say that we have to do something about London's air. I mean, the reality is, <laughs> like any capital city, most people understand that, you know, living in an area where there are lots of cars going about, lots of buses, lots of, you know, uh, HGV vehicles, restocking supermarkets and things like that, that it's going to be a dirtier place to live than, you know, the shires. Mm. But there's, and, you know, anything we can do to improve that, whether it's new technology, whether it's, I don't know, doing something like not increasing bus and train fares, as Sadiq Khan has done, <laughs> and making public transport more accessible. Nobody would argue with that. That that's a lovely. Th bring it on. That more, greater choice and more accessibility is a wonderful thing. But that's not what's happening here. I think you know. I wrote for Spike to this uh, last week that Sadiq Khan is taking London's for a very expensive ride because if you look at the facts of what's happening, that for example, you know, ULES charges have generated millions, mm. millions and millions of pounds that councils um, are using low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, 
institutions where they basically shut off roads that are often done sort of quasi undemocratically are also making millions of pounds. Um, you know, there is there's there's a bit of a racket going on here. And at the end, and people don't seem to realize that, you know, in order for a capital city to run for a for a, a and in such an important place as London, you know, for the kind of the, the toilet paper to get delivered to Sainsbury's, for, you know, care workers to get to their patients, for plumbers to be able to come in and fix your toilet, that they have, these people have to have vehicles and they have to be able to get around. And banning vehicles, pet diesel vehicles that are older than 2015 is basically a pull tax. Yeah. It's saying that unless you have enough money, you know, over 30 grand to buy a um, an electric vehicle, you, you, your, your livelihood's gone and your freedom of the road is gone. Uh, so it's, you know, I think this is a really terrible move um, from the mayor of London. And I'm very glad to see that there are some sort of normal borrowers in London where let's, you know, remember in places like Bexley, there's like one bus every sort of three hours <laughs> yeah. um, that are revolting against this. Yeah. I mean, Rakeev, is it just that, um, you know, white van man or the mum who has to drop her kids off to school they just don't really count that politically, particularly in the sort of the eyes of the mayor of London. That's not his kind of, um, that's not his biggest fans, maybe. Well, um, I, I think that the, the mayor of London represents all Londoners. Uh, and, and the truth of it is that he's bringing in these restrictions, um, which are ultimately designed to reduce car related emissions. But, but, but London's public transport infrastructure it isn't of a high quality to co- compensate for that. Mm. That, that, that. That's the truth of it. Um, of, of course, there'll be an argument that individual freedom, people have the right to use their own car in any way they like. Uh, but, but I think Ella makes a really good point here. We live in a country where the public transport infrastructure is just not up to scratch at all. And then on top of that, you, ha- you have the, the problems surrounding financial accessibility. Train fares are incredibly high. Um, and, and I think just more generally that Ella's talking about Bexley, but there'll be the, 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 there'll be other parts of London where the bus service isn't particularly reliable. So the point is, is that if you are going to go down this road of car related restrictions, then at least provide or at least invest in terms of trying to improve your public transport in a way that makes it more accessible for your own people. And at the moment, the mayor of London has simply not lived up to meeting those um, meeting those objectives. And, and finally, Ella, do you think this is a sign that Sadiq Khan is not really a mayor for London? I mean, we he's someone who we know his opinions about the abortion situation in the US. We know what he thinks about Trump um, being allowed back onto Twitter. Um, we know what he thinks about the Black Lives Matter protests. I mean, it seems that... This is the only time I can remember him um, talking about something London related and it's a disaster. Yeah, he's completely out of touch. I mean, you know, he is, you know, on the one hand, absolutely everybody knows that he was elected. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that Sadiq Khan is a mayor for a certain very affluent section of London. Um, and that's played out in the the sort of scandal of that is emerging of the consultation process for the expansion of the, you know, this most latest expansion of the ULES, in which, you know, City Hall actively went out searching for um, but you know, votes that would be in favour of a ULES and you know uh, contributions that would be in favour of a ULES by quizzing you know young people who mm. most of them don't drive and most <laughs> of them support you know uh, Extinction Rebellion all that kind of thing. They also you know uh, allegedly just basically wiped thousands of contributions from um, a group that were that were pro car pro freedom of driving and um, because they you know city hall said that it was just a copy and paste job i mean that's uh, as if that sort of makes it Ill- an illegitimate means of engaging in a consultation process so it's you know some some people have used the word rigged and i don't know whether that's too strong or not but certainly there's there's a fishy smell about this consultation process which shows that you know sadiq khan has always throughout the whole um history of ulez said oh yes i'll listen to what londoners think and then when the results come in as they have done time and time again that people are actually against this kind of crackdown on transport uh, he said i don't care i'm doing it anyway so you know that he is little little lord 
Khan of London and he is, you know, exerting his authoritarian powers in ways which are clamping down on white van mum like me, you know, on on uh, people who um, need to get around. As Rakib says, you know, I don't think Sadiq Khan has ever tried to do the big shop with his kids on a bus because <laughs> if he did, he'd know what kind of suffering it is to try and do that. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.